If you're trying to decide between the base model M1 13 inch MacBook Pro from 2020 or the new 14 inch M1 Pro MacBook Pro that was just released last week, then this video should ultimately help you decide which one to get, or at least I hope it does. Is the M1 Pro really that much better or can you just save your money and be better off with the M1 from last year? Well, the M1 MacBook Pro from 2020 will actually start off at $1299, and with it comes an 8-core CPU, an 8-core GPU, 8 gigabytes of RAM, 256 gigs of internal storage, and of course, the M1 chip. And yes, you can configure some of those options to get some upgraded specs if you want to, but of course, it'll be more money. The new 2021 base model, which starts at 14 inches, comes with the M1 Pro chip, 8-core CPU, a 14-core GPU, 16 gigabytes of RAM, and 512 gigs of SSD storage, and of course comes in at $19.99. It's very important that I stress that if you're just looking for a good laptop that can handle standard workflows like answering emails, video calls, typing up Excel sheets or Word documents, etc., then the M1 machine will be more than enough for those needs, but I'd also recommend just getting an M1 MacBook Air from 2020 at that point because it's cheaper and the performance is actually pretty similar to the M1 MacBook Pro. Or you can even go the M1 Mac Mini route if you want to do that instead. If you're looking for something to help with a more graphic intensive workload or if you're in the creative field and you need something that can keep up but won't break the bank, then the M1 Pro is just a better overall experience, in my opinion, than last year's model. Now, aside from better performance, there's actually a longer list of reasons why I do think it's worth spending that extra money on the new new model over the M1. So let's first start off with these displays. They're absolutely incredible from the look with the reduced bezels all the way to the actual display performance, its accuracy, vibrancy, the mini LED back panel, 120 Hertz ProMotion, it's all just really, really nice. And it's definitely a huge difference when you're using the new M1 Pro MacBook and then switching back and looking at last year's M1. I know the notch can be a bit controversial and let's be honest, right out of the box, it's not perfect. Some users have reported issues with menu bar items hiding behind the notch and you're not able to get to it and things are just not adjusting correctly, but it does appear that Apple is already offering updates and adjustments so that developers can actually make those adjustments themselves and fix the issue. Personally, the notch hasn't been a problem for me, and the FaceTime camera that's behind that notch has been improved to 1080, although I'm not entirely sure it looks that much better, but it is slightly better. I still think it's a very underwhelming camera in you know 2021 especially, but I guess it is slightly improved than what we're used to on laptops, so there's that. Now let's talk about the rest of the body, and perhaps one of the more important updates in my mind and that's the reintroduction of some ports that these laptops have desperately missed. The M1 from last year only has two Thunderbolt ports on the left side, and then one 3.5 millimeter headphone jack on the right, and that is it. This year, we actually get three Thunderbolt 4 USB-C ports, two on the left and one on the right. There's also a new version of a familiar MagSafe charging port, which is located on the left. There's a headphone jack and now an HDMI port reintroduced as well as the SD card reader, which is my personal favorite new addition to this year's MacBook. The keyboard is slightly different as well. I'm not entirely sure what exactly is different with the keys themselves, but they do feel slightly softer, a bit more mushy to me in comparison to the M1 model, but I actually do like the way it feels. Um, the two biggest changes to this area are the removal of the touch bar and the keyboard being entirely black instead of the keys just being black with the background being the shade of whatever color MacBook Pro you decided to get. Kind of that two-tone look is now removed. Now the touch bar is going to be a love-hate situation for most of you. If you can't live without the touch bar, then I guess this makes your decision easier. You can get the M1 from last year, which still has it. I'm happy to have the new full-size dedicated function keys, so I prefer this outcome. The speakers have been much improved. This is especially true on the 16-inch model, as they sound absolutely incredible, but I personally think that the 14 inch has huge improvement gains as well in quality and overall loudness compared to last year's 13 inch M1 MacBook Pro. 
And that's really it when it comes to the overall design. I mean, the laptops do look physically different. It's not by much when closed, but enough to tell that they are not the same, at least not the same design that we've had over the past five years. And it is enough of a change up in my opinion for me to just get that new feeling when you open it out of the box and think, yes, this is actually a new MacBook Pro. All right, so benchmarks and performance time. Now we did a Geekbench test a few times already, but for those that want to know the exact difference in scores between these two machines, here you go. There's obviously a pretty decent difference, especially in the GPU department, as this model has a 14 core GPU compared to last year's eight core GPU, but where the new MacBook really shines is just in my real world use cases. We just did a comparison between the M1 Pro and M1 Max machines. And so I'm going to borrow a couple of tests from that video and then just kind of retool it and specifically focus exporting this 4K timeline and playing back 8K footage. Now exporting this timeline in my typical YouTube upload settings, which generally produces an MP4 file, which is a little over two gigs. Uh, the M1 Pro finished in around two minutes and 55 seconds, sometimes two minutes and 40 seconds. And the M1 from last year finished at three minutes and 40 seconds. Then I decided to test some 8K Red Raw footage. And yes, the M1 Pro rendered it all super fast compared to uh, what the M1 did, but after it all rendered out, surprisingly, it played pretty well on the M1 MacBook Pro, but the more you try to do something with the project as things were going and change camera settings on the fly, the more the computer started to get bogged down a bit and you even got the pinwheel to show up a few times, telling me that I should probably lay low and give it a minute to catch up. That's definitely not the case with the M1 Pro. It handled 4K, 8K footage like a champ. There was a few drop frames, but it really quickly as editing went on caught up and the footage played back honestly perfectly as time went on, which was not the case with the M1 from last year. There's also a lot less RAM, about half actually, on the M1 from last year coming in at only eight gigs while the M1 Pro starts with 16 gigabytes of RAM and also comes with an added uh, internal SSD of 512 gigs. Now the internal storage from the uh, base model M1 is 256, which is laughable and really, really hard to uh, work with, and you're definitely going to need to update there. The SSDs are both pretty neck and neck in terms of performance, but the eight gigabyte difference in RAM is pretty noticeable and probably one of my bigger complaints with the M1 MacBook Pro base model from last year. Overall, I do think the M1 Pro base model MacBook Pro might just be the best value here, at least when it comes to Apple Silicon inside of a MacBook Pro. And if the goal is to get a base model so you can save money while getting the most performance, the M1 Pro version is honestly your best bet. Because for starters, the extra 256 gigs of internal storage and eight gigabytes of RAM really does help in my opinion. And if you wanted to, you could just add those as upgrades to an M1 build and you'll still be saving roughly $300 when all is said and done, but we haven't even mentioned the extra CPU and GPU cores, the latter of which is crucial for the better performance that I've noticed during my video editing workflows and just overall better experience and I just genuinely had a better experience editing videos and getting work done on my M1 Pro over using the M1 machine from last year. I was pretty amazed at what the M1 could do last year, but the improvements that I'm noticing with the M1 Pro just takes things to another level. Couple that with the new design, the more ports, the improved display, ProMotion, improved webcam, speakers, etc. It just makes the money worth every penny, in my opinion, if you're looking at either one of these base models. Of course, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments down below. And uh, yeah, let me know which one you plan to get. Again, if you don't need any of that power, but you want an M1 Apple Silicon machine, then just get a MacBook Air or a Mac mini. You'll save tons of money in the long run. But if you're looking for a MacBook Pro and you need as much performance as you can while saving money, I would highly recommend the M1 Pro. But again, let me know your thoughts in those comments. This has been Dan with Mac Rumors. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you around in the next video.